everybody. Uh, welcome to the seminar tent. If you want to uh, just check you're in the right place, um, we are going to be talking about whether fungicides or we're going to be discussing with you whether fungicides have a place in regenerative agriculture and, and what place that might be. Um, the idea is to facilitate a discussion, so I'm hoping that you have also come with thoughts and points of view. But the way we're going to run is I'm going to ask the three people on the stage to introduce themselves in their point of view. Then I'm going to let them ask each other a few points of clarification if they have any. Ask them, ask each other questions. Um, we're going to stop Saeed and um, uh, Stuart degenerating into a fist fight because um, we've got Andy here to break that up, so that will be fine. Um, and we're then going to just literally open the floor and we have a man at the back who's going to run around with a microphone and, and keep us right. I'm going to make sure we finish around about 10 twos um, so that we've got a chance, you've got a chance to get to the next place you need to be on time. Uh, so that's how we're going to run um, for the next 50 or so minutes. Obviously if you run out of questions, well you get more time to go and look at other things. But it's important for us to make sure that we've given you a chance to ask your questions and the speakers are around um, afterwards if, if you want to stay. We'll, we'll need to move out of the tent but we'll, people are around if people want to follow up and ask questions. So my name is Elizabeth Stockdale. I am simply a chairman today. I claim to know almost nothing about fungicides. They happen above ground, well, mostly. Um, and I'm a soil scientist. So I'm going to hand straight over to, to Stuart Knight, um, who is director of the um, the, the NIAB and the Deuteronomy part, and I've been introduced himself much better than me, um, to, uh, to start us off. Do you find this have a place in regenerative agriculture, Stuart? Uh, thank you. Is this working? Yep. All right, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, as I said, my name is uh, Stuart Knight. I'm the uh, director of NIAB Agronomy, um, but my background is as, as a research economist, and I've been working on fungicides probably for the last 30 odd years, um, probably working on soils for a lot less. But I think that's probably, like most of us, uh, 30 years ago we were really only interested in largely in things like that, but so much has changed over the last 30 years. So, um, so disease management is a really crucial part of, of crop management, and, and we can't get away from that. If you, if you do nothing in terms of disease, uh, then you are likely to be throwing away anything up to 50% of your potential yield, not to mention quality, profit and everything else out of the window. So, so simply doing nothing is not an option. If we get it wrong, uh, then we are likely to be uh, potentially at risk of losing 20, 30, 40% again of our potential yield and out the window goes our profit and our quality. So it's really important that as we you know, look to the future, look to our farming systems, that disease management is a key part of that thinking, along with all the other aspects yeah. of a good farming system. So how do, we, how do we manage disease? Again, when I started 30 odd years ago, and indeed even further back than that, uh, you know, since then we've had a succession of, of very effective fungicide products, which have allowed us to uh, manage disease, keep on top of disease, eradicate disease, uh, even when we've created conditions that have favoured it. Uh, and, and that was fine for a while, until we started to realise that we were getting more and more problems with, with resistance, until we started to lose products, a loss of approvals, removal from the armoury. And then it became abundantly clear that strategy of just relying on fungicides was, was wrong and was unsustainable and, and ultimately needed to change. And so over that last 15 years in particular, there's been growing recognition of the need to combine all the available tools to us in, in a more integrated strategy. Integrated pest management is, a, is an often used phrase, and that applies to disease, it applies to weeds, and it applies to diseases. So we need so that the, the sort of the most robust way forward is to have that integrated approach. And any future system, whether it's regenerative agriculture or any other thinking or approach or system or ideology, is is going to fail if it's just reliant on one thing because you will break that one thing. So I think regenerative agriculture uh, acknowledges that uh, because it's based really on achieving good outcomes from your farming system, about improving the system. It's not about saying there's only one practice or only one set of practices that's right for this situation. It's about uh, growers, their advisors, being able to choose the right tools uh, that's available for them to, to achieve the, the, the positive outcomes of the farming system. 
And clearly that's going to involve a lot, the, the internal tools, if you like, what the, what the system can do, what the biology can do, what the soil can offer, what the crop can offer. But that will need to be complemented at times with, uh, with external inputs, whether that's uh, fertilizers or indeed fungicides. So a system that brings together those things and is efficiently designed, well designed, so that it minimizes the dependence on external inputs, ultimately, but doesn't exclude them, um, is the right way forward. So from my, from my perspective, it's really important that fungicides are part of uh, regenerative agriculture, but they should not be a dominant part, and, and, and like anything, you know, we shouldn't have a system that's over reliant on them. And indeed, they will enable us at times to get the most out of the internal system inputs, whether it's the soils or the genetics of the crop, um, or the beneficials or whatever it is else that we're using as part of our, of our strategy. And so thinking about, uh, if you like, all the tools in the toolbox, how you bring them together and the uh, particular practices that you might use in your particular situation, for your particular environment, uh, cropping rotation, etc., that's going to work best with, uh, with, with, uh, in terms of bringing together those different inputs is really important. And I think Saeed is going to uh, give us a bit of an insight into some of those uh, different tools that are in the toolbox. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. So let me introduce myself. So I have been with NAPAC for the last two years, two and a half years as a regional agronomist. And I've been in the industry for the last nine years since I finished my PhD in 2012, I think. I feel so old now. Um, so I've been involved in, but my earliest research objective was how can I re reduce my reliance on fungicide inputs, how can I re reduce reliance on fertilizer inputs, because my objective is to learn more about soil and how soil interact with plants. So again, when I was asked by Elizabeth to talk on whether fungicide have any role in regenerative agriculture, so we were having discussion. Now, it's very difficult to define regenerative agriculture. For some people, people would say, I don't really want to use any fungicide, any herbicide, any fertilizer at all. For them, that's just regenerative agriculture. Some people would say, well, I would want to reduce my fertilizer inputs, fungicide inputs, because I can't live without fungicides or fertilizer. So for them, that will be regenerative agriculture. I would say that you have to sometime, in some situation, use plow, you have to cultivate soil sometimes, you have to use fungicides, sometimes you have to use maybe insecticide, whatever you need. Now, question is, how can we reduce our reliance on fungicides? So always start from soil. So if soil is healthy, now again, Elizabeth would say, soil is, soil is very complicated and very broad subject, because what is healthy soil? So for me, as an agronomist and as a grower, healthy soil is which is, it doesn't have any soil burn pest, where I can go and drill, my crops easily, where I can roll the crops or fields without any problem, and or I can use my pre-emergent, post-emergent herbicide without any problem. And they have plenty of soil biology that can maybe release some nitrogen if I want. Again, how can I keep my soil healthy? Another thing which people tend to say is, I don't really want to use any fungicide, and I want to use some snake oils, which I sometimes call them biostimulants. Uh, I'm not, I'm not against biostimulants. We have done a lot of work on biostimulants within NAPTAC. Now, uh, there is some evidence that some biostimulants can increase green leaf retention, some biostimulants can improve so-called crop health, but if you have yellow rust, are you going to use biostimulants to control yellow rust? You will have to use tebiconazole, which is some, most of the time, cheapest option. Again, if you have septoria, are you going to use biostimulants to control septoria? Well, generally speaking, if you have septoria, biostimulants wouldn't work. So you need to apply them before the disease. And then there are so many biostimulants, which you don't really know whether there's enough evidence, are they effective? There is no, un, I would say, independent information on biostimulants. Again, starting point from, as an agronomist, where should I begin? I would always say, uh, use healthy seed. Always do seed testing. Do, then decide whether you need a seed dressing. Because if you look at the papers, most of the seed dressings tends to have negative effect on soil biology. So if you don't really need uh, seed dressing, I would say probably don't use it. 
Uh, again, there are people saying that we can reduce our reliance on fungicide by growing blends of a range of varieties. Uh, Stuart and I, we were discussing, is a wrong idea that if I use a very resistant variety, which I think is resistant versus very dirty variety, because then you will be treating a resistant variety uh, using a program which is probably appropriate for a dirty variety. So it's better to use maybe resistant slash semi-resistant variety or somewhere in the middle. But again, there is not enough information whether blends can reduce your requirement for fungicide. Because if you've got a variety uh, which is quite rusty in a blend, you will still have to use tabiconazole to control rust. Uh, I would, I think, I'm keep talking, talking for a long time, but just one minute more. Uh, I strongly believe in nutrition. If you have right nutrition, right trace elements, I know some people have a very negative opinion about trace elements, but manganese and copper, if you apply at the right time, you use the right product and cheap product at the right stage, it can improve crop health, especially it can re allow you to reduce your, uh, I would say, uh, the incidence of mildew. I will shut up now, I think, and then we can have a discussion later on. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm Andy Howard. Uh, I am a farmer from Kent. I'm also part of Brownsville Agronomy, Abacus, and a Knuckle Scholar. Um, and I'm really here as, I guess, the farmer on the panel. Um, <clears throat> so in 2016, when I finished my Nuffield Scholarship, um, right or wrong, I decided that I was going to cut my uh, artificial inputs on the farm by 50% in five years. Um, we've pretty well done that um, while maintaining production or maintaining profit, should I say. Um, <clears throat> fungicides has been one of the easier ones. Herbicides is one that I find the hardest. Insecticides are pretty well gone, um, <clears throat> but they're all linked. Um, and we've done this by many different ways, from blends, from um, intercropping, healthy soil, Nutrition. Nutrition for me is, is the key to reduce fungicides and I guess the big elephant in the room for conventional agriculture is we use far too much nitrogen. Um, and excess nitrogen drives your disease. Um, so if you're trying to get 15 tonne of wheat and reduce your fungicide, you're probably going to fail. Um, <clears throat> so you've got you to understand what your goal is. We know our land probably isn't, isn't the best land in the world, so I'd rather grow a good crop of cheap cheap wheat that's uh, profitable rather than trying to get on the uh, yen awards at the end of the year. Um, <clears throat> um, so for me the question do fungicides have a place in regen ag? For me I answer that with more questions. Um, it depends. Um, at the moment um, I don't think anyone would claim yet that we have the knowledge to grow consistently in every part of the country 10 tonne of wheat without fungicides, even though I think we're getting close, um, but things go wrong, um, weather goes wrong, um, varieties, I mean, I've, I've made mistakes before and paid the price, you learn from your mistakes, but my mistakes have normally been linked back to nutrition, um, so it's, nutrition is the key. Um, <clears throat> a few other things, um, genetics won't save us. You can read a lot of stuff about these new resistant varieties, the BYDV, the disease, etc. If they're in a poor, in a poor environment, if they're in a poor system that's driving disease, they will, I guess, class the experts, will eventually break down. So we can't try and reduce fungicides just by genetics, even though it is important. Um, it's not, not key. Um, <clears throat> for me, seed and soil, are, are seed dressings appropriate in regen ag? I'd probably say no fungicide seed dressings, but when you're in transition and your soil isn't quite healthy yet, you might have to, or if your seed has got disease, I see it says. For me, putting a fungicide on the seed is the complete opposite of what you're trying to do in regen ag. You're trying to join the plants and the soils, um, and putting a barrier in between seems a little bit crazy. And um, we've normally found when we've got rid of seed dressings, the issues we've had are um, again down to nutrition rather than anything wrong. Um, and it gets easier the longer you do it. 
Um, so for me, failure, failure fungicides at the moment we need. Seed dressings, I think they're the ones that could be easiest, easiest saved and probably the ones that should be concentrated on. Um, <clears throat> another question for probably more for the experts is do you, do you reduce timings or do you reduce dose? Um, I think that's a key question because high doses drive disease resistance. It's a common misconception I get thrown at me all the time. Like you're lowering your fungicide dosage, you're driving resistance. Well, that's true for herbicides, but Bill Clark told me 10 years, 15 years ago, it's the opposite for fungicides. So when your agronomists put a high rate on of X, Y, Z to help resistance, well, they're actually driving resistance. So um, for me, I think that covers most of what I want to talk about in, um, in the introduction. Do you have any questions for those guys before we let them ask my questions? Well, the last one I think is quite a key one is reduced dose or reduced timings. I mean, we've done both. Um, I've gone now to reduce timings of fungicides, but I'm still normally going through the crop with nutrition, so I'm still doing something. I think the problem that some people have is think I'm going to do nothing. Well, having a healthy plant, unless you've got the perfect soil, it doesn't necessarily happen. You still have to do something. So, would you, what's your answer about reduced timings or reduced dosage? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess it depends on what the start point is. But uh, for most people, uh, there is uh, the two challenges for them is one, there are unnecessary applications in the system. Whether it's multiple products going into an individual mix, we don't actually need some of those components. Uh, whether it is sort of intermediate sprays that aren't actually needed, um, or, or whether it's uh, simply not matching what you're doing in terms of an individual field basis to actually require that field. And again, I think that's a really important part of a, of a good system, is actually, if you've got a system, and I, I know it's, it's, it's tempting, and I, and I understand why people do it, is it right to have one fungicide strategy across the farm, it's simple, order one lot of stuff, everything the same goes in the spray, and the spray multiple field. That is not gonna be the most efficient way of doing it. And there is no substitute for actually trying to match what you're doing in individual individual field. So I think that's where you get the opportunity to say this field doesn't need a T0, this field doesn't maybe need a T3, this field may not even need a T1. Um, most fields are always going to need a T2, and in fact you know, that is the key timing really in terms of yield for all, almost all, all circumstances. Um, so that would be one thing. And again, taking out individual products from the mix, reducing the doses to match the varieties in the situation. If you've got a later drilled. Uh, crop of a, uh, of a more resistant variety, why are you using high dose? Uh, keep the doses down, as you say. Uh, high doses cost you money, uh, they don't improve efficacy over a certain point, and, uh, and, and inevitably, uh, they, if, particularly if you use high doses of the most selective products, they will select for things that don't control them. Uh, and so, you know, the dose argument is always about using the appropriate dose. It's not necessarily always going to be low, but it's going to be appropriate to the situation. Uh, because again, the, if you let disease get away from you and you end up then trying to chase it later in the season uh, by bunging everything in the tank on it, and, and that's not a good strategy either. So try and match what you do in terms of timings, in terms of dose, in terms of uh, products that are actually in there to the situation you've got. And that's where you, know, you need to use your knowledge, your knowledge of what's happening on your farm, knowledge at an individual field level, of all the other things that you're doing to match those that, that you come up with the right with the right solution. Yeah. On, a, sorry, on a personal level, what I normally do with my agronomist, he gives me a dose and I cut it in half. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, I am doing other things. I'm applying biology to the leaf surface. I'm applying nutrition. I've taken tests, so I know how good it is. And again, it depends depend on the variety. If it's Zayat, yellow rust, you don't try and skimp because you can see the bunch in the backside. Um, but I think the appropriate dose changes the longer you've been doing these things and the more you learn. The appropriate dose from the manufacturer, whoever it is giving the appropriate dose, does change. And we haven't had actually had an issue of cutting doses in half or even more but we are doing other things. Well, what I, 10, 15 years ago, I was doing both. I was doing the fungicide full dose plus the nutrition and everything. I was finding myself spending a fortune. That can, that can be quite a trap to avoid not to do too much and you end up spending more money. I just one thing I didn't mention, timeliness. Timeliness is key. If you get your timings right, that's when you'll be able to minimize the dose. Do you want to comment on the interaction with nutrition, side? Yeah, uh, well, firstly, I will go back to what Stuart said uh, about uh, dose of fungicides. So if you use high rate of fungicides, there are so many papers 
you are going to select the strain which will be resistant or get resistant to high rate of fungicides. So the thing is, to begin with, we need to treat what is in front of us. If we have growing varieties such as extase or Theodore, for example, we can use low rate of fungicides. Again, coming back to nutrition and biology and biostimulants, for example, now, I always ask my customers, because there are so many people trying to sell, as I shouldn't say snake oils, but they are trying to sell on, on my farms. Question is, why do you want to use those products to reduce your reliance on fungicide? If 50% of the fungicide is doing a good job, do you really need to spend that money on those products, which actually you don't really have any evidence so far? I have set up so many timeline trials where we have been comparing range of biostimulants, and believe me or not, it's they don't, but in most of the situation, they don't make any huge difference. We've got proper replicated trials where we have used certain biostimulants. They have made a difference. So I'm not saying all biostimulants are rubbish, but there are few, but most of them are really rubbish anyway. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is that if you are reducing your reliance on fungicide and spending money, what is the cost of that product? It's always down to the cost. So if I want to control your rest, and I say I need a healthy crop, and if, you ha if I have a healthy crop, which means I will have no yellow rust, but in order to achieve that, I have to spend 20 pounds on biostimulants. Am I ready to spend that 20 pounds? Well, I will be if I'm getting paid by TEFRA or basic payment schemes where I'm actually being compensated for my, maybe, for my initiative. Like sometime we were, in the past we were paid for not using metaldehyde, and instead of using metaldehyde, we were asked to use slugs, uh, uh, ferric phosphate, for example. So in that situation, I might use some, uh, some products where those products can reduce my reliance on fungicide. But my question is, why do you really need, uh, again, coming back to the appropriate rate, for yellow rust, 125 grams of heavy conazole cost me around four pound. That's a very good job. If I have a variety stays, I might be spending 25, 30 pounds. But if I reduce the rate to half or uh, 15 pounds on fungicide, but I will have to spend at least another 15 to 20 pounds on the products, which I don't have any evidence so far. I don't really have as an agronomist. I look after the crops and I inspect the crop once or twice in a month. And I send you a recommendation if you apply at the right time, at the right growth stage, I'm not really worried, but if I send you a recommendation of biostimulants and I don't go there for a week and my crop is filthy and yellow and septoria everywhere, what I'm going to do? I will be spending more money on high rate of fungicide. So I will shut up here now, but again. Uh, do you have a question for Andy while you have the microphone? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say is that I know you're doing a lot of trials on biology and spraying something on your crops and you feel that you don't really need, but you have reduced your reliance on fungicide. But is it your, uh, I would say, observation or have you been able to replicate on other farms? We did, um, 12 years ago, we did a whole massive trial on farm um, on all these questions and the best margin was the lower dose with nutrition. Um, replicate on other farms, I haven't been doing that much um, with Abiscus for very long yet. So, But as you said, every farm is different. Um, my biostimulants, the most I pay for biostimulants, if I, if I use one, is about 90p a hectare. Anything above that. And that's got, Tricontinol's got evidence, you can look on the web websites. There is evidence that it helps. You know, these ones for 25, 30 pound a hectare, well, you know, you're just swapping one cost for, for another, so I do completely agree. And the same, same with nutrition, I make sure I keep it cheap um, and keep, keep the cost down. Um, you can be very quickly dragged into a system where you're spending more money, and as you say, maybe get the same yield. But it's, it's as a farmer, it is a minefield out there, because you, you read, read all you want and everything, and Everyone, everyone's trying to sell you something. You think, oh, do I really need this? Or there's evidence for this, evidence for that. Sometimes you have to step back and just say no, and just just try try a hectare on the farm. Um, but we haven't had this year. I've done 
no T noughts, no T ones on wheat. Uh, a reasonable T two and a low red T three, and our, our wheats are fine. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend a customer to do that in year one because uh, it we you have to learn as you're going along through the so years. How would you take a new customer on that journey that you've been on? How would you start someone off? First thing is to get the spade out and look at their soils because if, if they've got compaction, if you've got low organic matter, your soil isn't going to be providing the, the nutrition biology to the plant to make it healthy. So you've got to do the basics first and the basics from everything in groundswell, the basics is a soil. Um, so that is that is where I'd start and then slowly, slowly try a hectare here of, well try that without latitude. Do you get take all? If you don't, well, try and try ten hectares next year. It's a slow process, unfortunately. It's not. I've been doing it for twenty years, and I'm still mucking it up and getting it wrong and learning. But um, unless you try, you just don't know. And it's the same with the biased inlets. Unless you do an area without it, you don't know. Um, so, does that answer your question? That's, that's good. Stuart, have you got anything that you particularly want to pick up with Andy? Well, I was going to ask about the journey you've been on, but you've, you've given a bit of uh, insight to that. So I'll ask you instead about your rotation. So have you made changes to your rotation or, or, or made decisions about your rotation as a result of the sort of journey you've been on? Our rotation has changed. If I went back 10 years, it would be quite different. We got rid of rape about seven, eight years ago. Also, you'd rape, we had first sit and wilt. Our farm's been growing rape for 40, 50 years, and once you've got wilt, you're a bit stuffed. Um, so that was before the flea beetles, so we got rid of rape. Um, <clears throat> we've now bought in grass seed, um, two year legume fallows to help with grass weeds and build up the, um, build up the uh, organic matter. More spring crops than we would have had 10, 15 years ago, and from enough of more, more intercrops, and the intercrops is. No, we're starting to find that we really probably, on some of the intercrops, don't necessarily need any fungicides. You know, PGRO, we're working with them, and they found in our beans and oats last year, um, compare, comparing beans by themselves to beans and oats, there was 75% less rust in the beans. That's not zero. I'm pointing out, that's not zero rust. There was rust there, so depending on the, on the conditions. But um, it's the same with blends. We haven't done too much on blends yet, blends of varieties, but that's the simple, cheap way of starting that, get that diversity in. And you can quite easily, if you look on Twitter, there's some quite stark pictures of yellow rust in between a blend and between a, between a, um, between a, um, a single variety. But again, it's not necessarily zero disease. So that's where you've got to be pragmatic and say, look, in two weeks time is the brown rust or yellow rust in here going to be ripping through it if it is do something about it um, but it does give you more relaxed and more relaxed on the timings and more relaxed on the dose because i have got those backstops in there i guess right i'm going to give you, you three another chance to just comment on anything you like while these guys think about their questions if you start indicating you might want to ask a question we have a man with a microphone at the back He's going to keep, kind of have a look at where the forest of hands are and, and think about where his route is. So if you want to ask a question, I'm just going to give these guys a minute to, before we go out. So I'm going to, I'm going to go backwards, Andy. I'm going to let you go first. Is there anything before we just open up that you... Are you good? So I've got a minute question anyway. So I can see a lot of farmers actually brewing so-called bugs on their farm and applying to improve soil biology. The concern as an agronomist I have is what are they brewing? Because there are no health and safety information, whether they are going to become part of food chain, what will be the impact on livestock, for example, what's going to affect my health. And we might have another COVID bug uh, in our system. So that might be a little bit of reaction. Yeah. <laughs> we, we see where you're going. So. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't just say that compost tea might spell COVID, spread COVID. We didn't say that. <laughs> From my point of view, we brew biology, but the stuff we put on the leaf is from a packet so I know exactly XYZ what was in it but we are starting to look at compost extract for the soil um, a fungal one um, which I don't think shouldn't enter the food chain but I would agree compost teas <coughs> stick your finger up in the air and what have you got at the end of it it's very difficult but compost extract putting it down with the seed um, to re replace the 
you know, the fungal spores, etc., that we do kill with fertilizers, with herbicides, with fungicides. Let's, let's be honest, they are pesticides and they will also have an impact on the um, soil biology, but we have to accept that farming is a compromise and that will happen. So we're, we're starting to experiment adding that biology back um, through through compost extracts, but I don't have any experience yet, and it could go all wrong. So, but it's cheap. Stuart, is there anything you particularly want to just before I'm, I'm watching for hands and, and a microphone to go somewhere? So, uh, Matt, just find someone and go and stand next to them so we're ready. Yeah, that's cool. I, I just, I just wasn't the, the microphone's coming across to the first question. I just add, I think the importance of knowing your enemy. I think understanding where you're at with, with your with your crop. I think we've, it's already been mentioned about the importance of seed testing. Seed testing is critical and, and will often enable you to make uh, rational decisions about whether a seed treatment is actually needed or not. Uh, you know, look, look out for information around monitoring of, of disease pests, etc., that are in the system. You know, looking at your own crops, see what's there, making sure you're comfortable about identifying what's there, knowing how quickly it's spreading, uh, and all those sorts of things I think are really important if you want to make good decisions. So it's, you know, it, all, I think one of the things that is often thought is, is, is about intensive farming is real intensive farming is knowledge intensive farming. It's about you knowing what's going on, what decisions to make, what's the right thing to do in the situation. And often that knowledge intensive farming will allow you to, to take a, a less intensive approach to, to other inputs. Thank you. Can people ask you questions? Just tell us who they are and then if they can, to um, if, if it's useful to direct a question to someone, do that as well. But please tell us who you are to start with. Hi, um, I'm Kate from Orion Future Technologies. Um, we, we provide uh, sustainable crop inputs um, to reduce our facility usage. Um, my question for the panel is, what is your experience or opinion on the use of uh, natural silicon to replace options such as seed treatments and also work synergistically with fungicides to increase um, its natural resistance to fungi and then therefore reduce the need for fungicide and possibly pesticide and pests in the crops. So the question around the use of silicon, does anyone want to start? Um, from a farmer's point of view, until recently, it's been a lovely idea, but all the products don't mix with anything else and you end up blocking up your sprayer um, and you have to do an extra pass. Um, Silicon's one I find, it's like nitrogen, it's everywhere in the soil, it's not, the soils aren't short of silicon, so it's, for me it's a biological link that's missing, um, and I, it's one that I struggle with, because I also ask the question, how much silicon do I need in a tissue test? No one seems to know the answer. About 300, maybe 500, 700 would be good. Oh, well, that's not much use really. So, in the same, do you need a fungicide? Do you need silicon? And I, the question is, I don't know because no one seems to know. This might know how much silicon do you need in your tissue test? No. So, <laughs> it, it's a difficult one. But I, I have used them, and I'm not saying they're not worthwhile. But I think we need to know how to use them and when to use them. Um, I'm not. I'm not convinced we quite know that yet. I think in the, the some of the formulations coming out now, a lot more user friendly. Um, you know, I remember five years ago, some agronomist said, "Oh, we've got silicon product. There's an insecticide." So well, that's not much use for my um, plants, is it? Because it was an insecticide. Um, but yeah, I, it's interesting. I'm just keeping an eye on it at the moment. I was just going to ask a question, really, about. Depends what you're using it for. I mean, silicon uh, is often used as a as a surface product. So if you're using it as a surface product to uh, interfere with uh, you know, disease getting into the crop in the first place, or to maybe make it difficult for disease to adhere to the surface or whatever, that would be it's a very different story to to silicon nutrition, which is probably a relatively minor significance, I would say, for for a, for a cereal crop, for example. So. I think you know it, it, there is there is definitely scope to look at products that provide defences to crops working in a different way, uh, particularly surface surface activity to stop disease becoming established in the first place. But I can't really comment about any individual products that are out there at the moment. Thank you. Question over here. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Charles Shropshire, uh, Gs. We uh, farm in Cambridgeshire Fens, far from here. 
Um, so just want to add a point about silica. We've been doing trials with it now for about three years around trying to reduce uh, fungicide and we did a trial this year on six days and it was absolutely covered with grass. So it's, as a, uh, on the surface, we're not really seeing anything, but I think the point around we're making around where is the best place to apply it to get it through the roots, and that's actually the next point of what we're going to be starting to look at a bit more. Uh, we're doing it by diametaceous surface on the product, but actually one thing it does do, it does give you some, uh, we're finding it actually gives us some uh, protection against certain pests. So anyway, that, I thought I'd just add that in. Um, my question really is, so we're farming, our average organic mass is probably about 25% across our ground, and uh, we are desperately trying to work out how we can reduce our fungicide usage. So we're growing salads, intensive salads, so horticulture, uh, vegetables, and then uh, we have some arable in the rotation as a break crop. So growing lettuce and celery, which are salad crops, is uh, incredibly dependent upon uh, fungicide use every seven days basically for the crop life. Crops growing in the summer 40 days sort of yeah down to about 40 days the quickest up to 60 the longest. So a massive challenge for us is how we can manage nutrition on such organic matter soils. So basically that is my question to you. Not what the are. Uh, Charles I'm hoping any, any sympathy for your soils. <laughs> So I've, I've been shooting over your farm, and you have no sympathy. Um, but um, I, it is a difficult one, and it's one, it comes the same back with weed control as well on the similar soils, because Stephen Briggs has got similar soils for you in Peterborough, and his farm grows weed, broadleaf weeds, like, you know, gets rid of one lot with a hoe, and the next one they're coming. Um, to be honest, I, I, it's, it, it's difficult when you're, you guys are on such high higher value type margins that you probably are running on I, I having a failure is is something that's difficult I guess I've learned from my failures um, but I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for you I'm afraid no. without thinking about it maybe I'll see you later at the pub uh, and I was just going to say, I mean, I think that, that's your challenge really is that if the crops you're dealing with, it's not like cereals where, okay, if you get it a little bit wrong, it's okay, you might lose a little bit of a year, but actually it's not going to be a disaster, it's still sell the crop, and you get it wrong with the veg crop, and you know, it can become unmarketable very quickly, and, and, and that, that makes it much harder to take a risk. I, mean, I, think, I think a lot of the principles that we've talked about so far are applicable to, to broadly to all crops, you know, thinking about all the different parts of the chain. Uh, and making sure that uh, you know, we set things up to, to have a minimal disease risk in the first place, I think is important. And I mean, again, I know there are quality aspects, size aspects are set, essentially associated with things like planting density and so on, but um, all those things you know, can, can influence the, the, the microclimate for disease development. So it's very much a case, I think, of thinking about all those different elements in the system. And uh, yeah, if you're dealing you know, with fence soils as well, I mean, you've got the added complication of, of the difficulty in determining what your nutrient supply is going to be, let alone how much you might actually need to then apply. Um, so yeah, I, I, I appreciate the challenge and I don't think there's any quick fixes, but I think all the principles we've talked about this morning are, are still relevant to those crops. Charles, have you looked into intercropping your um, vegetables? Uh, yeah, so, okay. In that is uh, having a physical barrier yeah. for the disease. Obviously, it's a machinery issue as well. I think, I think that's definitely one for the pub, isn't it? Let's fix Charles's veg systems in the pub later. Um, anyone with suggestions? You all see what he looks like now. Are you going to be in the earthworm arms later? <laughs> see him about the place. If you've got ideas, I think actually one of the things that you're open to is, is trying those things. So if people do have ideas, do uh, another question? Hi, it's uh, Richard from RSPB, a uh, question for Andy. You, you talk about um, having reduced your inputs by 50% and you're aiming for good, cheap wheat rather than boosting the sort of yield records. Over that time, have you been able to monitor and detect any change in your yields relative to what you had prior to that reduction? Profit has stayed, has improved. Um, which is the reason I'll be here next year. Yields have been variable, but then if you look back at the last five years, uh, some of the weather has been horrendous and some has been fantastic. So 
average yields I find difficult because it depends if you asked me in 2019 I'd have a different question answer to last year um, but what I find with our system is improve your soil lower your costs widen your rotation so your risk is lower in a bad year you probably aren't going to be at risk of making a loss as in someone who's in a bad year still pushed for high yields and spent lots of money who's only got one or two crops in their system they're the ones that could get hit so for me it's more of a risk management tool but I'm still here and having to pay tax in October so we're doing all right. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Erica Bauer, I'm a student at uh, Reading University. I was wondering what the evidence says about the impact of fungicides on the beneficial mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Um, both the foliar feeding, but probably foliar sprays, but probably more of the seed treatment. I guess that's where it matters for Any evidence on mycorrhizal fungi? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question and, and one that's often asked. I mean, ultimately, we know that some fungicides uh, are likely to impact on uh, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi if they come into contact with them in some quantities in the soil. I think a, a really key point about foliar fungicides is that if you're applying foliar fungicides and most of them ending up on the soil, then you've got a real problem because they're not going to be improving your disease control, they're not going to be benefiting the plant. So I, I think I, I, you know, it, it's always worth thinking about have you got adequate target there to make sure that those are properly deceptive. Obviously if you're actually deliberately applying products to the soil, uh, maybe because you're trying to target uh, a soil, soil born problem, uh, whether it's uh, maybe a potato crop and you're, and you're putting a fungicide on for, uh, um, for, for the target there, then, it, then obviously there's a bigger issue. Um, but um, I don't think it, it's not really widely understood which fungicides uh, have an impact, how long the impacts last, whether it's, uh, in a, and how it, how it actually impacts on, on the fungi. Um, but clearly we know there are likely to be some, some issues there. So I think it's, you know, it's really important to, um, to bear that in mind. But there isn't the information out there, there needs to be more work done to understand how it is. I mean, of course, AMF themselves, um, can actually help plants fight disease. A lot of people think about uh, a muscular mycorrhizal fungi as, as assisting with, with phosphate uh, access, phosphorus access for Allah, assisting with nitrogen uptake, uh, assisting with water uptake, but actually AMF have been shown to have benefits for some diseases like eros reduction uh, and uh, even potentially assisting with, with some viruses. Um, so you know, there's some positive things out of AMF which is a reason why it's important we do know more about how they interact with other inputs into the system. Uh, sorry, sorry. You go. Obviously, farming, as a general, as I said before, is a compromise. You are going to have an effect. We don't quite know what. If you look through, there is a list of what fungicides do what to some, and some are actually beneficial to some microbes, not necessarily MF. So it's not a simple fungicides are bad for biology. Um, but there will be some effect, and th th that is exactly the reason that we're doing these bioreactors to try and add some compost extract in every year to try and top up. Um, but the other key thing that people forget about is that AMF prefer to have a living root to live off. So actually just having roots in the ground 24-7, 365 days a year is probably something that I would work on more than necessarily worrying too much if I'm putting a T2 or not putting a T2 on having living roots constantly, I'd say is more key for holding those AMF to the food to the next crop. Can I just add, there are a lot of papers anyway where seed dressing and certain fungicide can have negative effect on soil biology. One of them which I was reading day before yesterday was on tabiconazole. The half-life of tabiconazole is between 46 to 600 days, which means it can have negative effect on soil biology, but again, it depends which soil biology we are talking about. Now, if I'm using tapiconazole to control rust, and I have already applied 200 kilograms of nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, and if my crop goes dead, just because I was worried about soil biology and I didn't use tapiconazole, what about the carbon footprint? Now, I'm just giving example. I'm not saying that crop is going to go dead because I didn't apply tapiconazole, but end of the day, we have to use a chemistry which is right for the crop, which is right at the right time. But <coughs> also the fungicide, up to a certain extent, can have negative effect if you apply in the wrong conditions. As Stuart said, if you apply on the leaf, 
it should stay on the leaf, shouldn't go down on the uh, on the ground. I think as an industry, we need to look at fungicides as a last resort instead of a first resort. Doing everything else first. I mean, it's not a lot of the time. It's not even questions whether whether you're doing a T naught or a T one. You are doing one because that's what we always do. I think the way I'm coming at it now after playing around is that I'm only doing the T2 or T3 because the nutrition and the biology haven't quite, I'm not confident they're quite going to do the job and I need the fungicide. So it's almost flipping that around. So I'm looking for probably two more at most. I've got one at the front and one there, that's great. So we're, we're, we're done then. I'm sure you've all got others and you're going to catch these guys in a little while. Thank you, Mark Horton, um, farmer from Poor Hilly Ground, Clare with Flints in the Chilterns in Bedfordshire. Um, a question for Andy. Um, you explained that the first thing you looked at was soil health when you started your journey on regen. For farmers who are starting, what about uh, the years you know, one and two and three to get the soil health into? the right sort of shape, what from your vast experience now would you recommend? And can I add a quick question for the whole panel? S dried sewage sludge, is that a good thing for regen ag? Again, it, it depends on when you get that sprayed out, what does it look like? You know, if, it's, if it's compaction and there's not much organic matter, then you have to leave the compaction to get air into the soil. Um, but increasing the organic matter is, is always going to be my first point and whether that's by um, applying organic manures or by growing cover crops, preferably by both, um, that would be my first choice of place and not to run too fast. You know, people plant cover crops and they plant, they go no-till and after two years so this doesn't work but they didn't take a spade out and see that they had a lot of compaction. So, um, Take it slowly, try a little bit, don't jump in. When I did a talk in Ireland a few years ago, and this guy said, oh, I didn't mint till on my whole farm. It failed, it cost me 200,000 or something. I said, you did the whole farm in one go. He said, yeah. I said, well, that's, that's your problem, just try a little bit. Um, and then the sewage sludge, or dried sewage cake, I have mixed feelings on it. If it was pure human waste, as in, human excrement, I would have an issue. It's the other stuff that's in it, um, the microplastics, the antibiotics, the, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think as a, as a fertilizer for a crop, I think it's very good. Um, and it's, it has a place in Regen Ag. There's a slight worry in the back of my head that one day some Cargills or something are gonna turn around and say, wait a minute, we just found this in, the, in our bread. That's come from the sewage sludge, and um, we won't we won't take any wheat from X Y Z. But that probably won't happen. But overall, I'd say it's a good thing. Yeah, I would say sewage sludge I've been using, especially on um, before drilling ILC drip. So I would say it has a place, especially for crops which you are growing, uh, where we have more uh, phosphate and nitrogen. I tend to have better establishment of ILC drip. So I don't really have to use any pyrethroids that will kill everything except flea beetle. So I would say it has a place, but it depends on the quality of Swiss sludge. Hi there, um, I'm Andrew Hunter, I'm a farmer up in Scotland, and I was just wondering what the panel thought about, is there too much of a push nowadays to try and keep crops spotlessly clean all the way up to harvest? You know, we're all so conditioned to make a T0, a T1, T2, T3, we're going to do T2 and a half, um, just to keep crops really whistle clean. And is it really that much of a problem if you've got a wee bit of Toria at the bottom of the canopy this time of year? It's very interesting to know that's the case. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And, and I think, certainly in England, I think it's a slightly different story in Scotland because your grain fill goes on that much longer elsewhere. But th there's always been, uh, I think, a uh, an over tendency for people to worry about disease coming in late into crops and do I need to put a T4 or a T5 on uh, and actually particularly for things like septoria uh, the, the, the time it takes to get going late in the season means that if it's already a problem 
uh, but like certainly by the sort of T3 stage, and you, you can almost forget about it. So, uh, absolutely, I think for for areas where you're down this way, where you're harvesting quite early, I think it's it's it was, there's it's too much worry about things in late in the season. In Scotland, yeah, okay, you've got a little bit of a longer grain fill period later on, so probably to keep things going for a little bit longer. But yeah, uh, I think key key to it really is is making sure you're dealing with a manageable. Uh, you've got your disease under control at T2 and into T3, and after that, you know, a lot of it is going to is, is not going to be a problem. The only thing that develops really fast late on um, that can catch you up sometimes is brown rust. Uh, it's got a very short uh, late period and, and actually can can significantly impact on your. But even that, if it's not really got going by T3, it's not going to be a problem. Um, from a farmer's point of view, I think the first thing you have to do is not care what your neighbours think, and then it doesn't really matter. Because I think that is half the issue is, oh, look at him, look at him, you know. His is brighter green than mine, I haven't put enough nitrogen on. Um, it's all about economics. You want to be swapping your profit and loss with your neighbour and then, then, then see who's right and wrong. Um, because it's not about how clean your crop is, it's how much profit you, in the end you make, because that's what pays for next year. So. It's been pragmatic and not, you know, I, you don't obviously you don't want a crop full of rust or anything, but um, if it's dirty in the bottom, you'll find this time of year the bottom couple of leaves die off anyway. So trying to keep them clean is probably going to cost you yield rather than the money that it is to, to make you yield. So don't worry about it. So thank you for your time. Uh, do fungicides have a place in Regen Ag? I think the answer is yes. Where and when? Well, the answer is it depends. And I think we've also learned that the importance here of, of bringing our knowledge, increasing our knowledge of, of the enemy that we're facing so that we can make those best strategic decisions, not just about fungicides, but the whole range of things that are available to us in the context of disease control, whether soil, can we talk to me about soil any time you like, whether um, uh, variety choice or many of the strategies we can put in place within the crop rotation, which will include, but, not our, but are not only fungicides. Thank you for your time. Have a great show.